It is truly good to be here this morning with you. Good to have all of our visitors with us today. You know, it is of utmost importance to know what truth is. And the reason is because Jesus said very plainly in John 8, verse 32 and 33, that it is truth that sets us free. And he has not left us wondering what truth is. Remember in his prayer to the Father there in John chapter 17, verse 17, speaking to, to God, he said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now, in order to know right from wrong, we have to be able to prove its veracity. And therefore, we have a command from the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. That word prove is actually a present active imperative verb. That means it is a command for us to do to prove these things, hold fast the good, but we're also to do these things continuously. We must continually prove what we have heard, what we have read, and make sure that what we are ingesting is actually profitable for our soul. And the reason is because the Apostle John gave a warning in 1 John 4 verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. I think it's quite ironic that the Apostle John is the one who's giving this warning, especially in today's time when people say, oh, if you tell people they're wrong, you're unloving. And here was the Apostle of love telling us, warning us of false teachers. God loves you. He wants you to be saved. Therefore, God wants you in his church. And he gives us reasons why and the evidence to prove such. Now, God has given us evidence that he wants men to be saved. God created man upright. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29. Man was created in the very image of God, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. And therefore, without sin. Man actually reflects the intrinsic nature of God. And if we actually have a sinful nature and we're born with that sinful nature, as some people claim, that's a bad reflection upon God himself. But God created man a free moral agent. We have the right to choose between right and wrong. He did this because chosen love is much higher than a forced love. Love means very little, if nothing at all, if it is not by choice. Adam walked with God there at the first. And there he had a special fellowship between God and himself. Until the great tempter, Satan, came along. Satan comes along and in his subtlety he deceives the woman that God gave him. And to disobeying God's law concerning the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam yielded to her coercion to do the same thing. Well, because they transgressed God's law and they chose to do evil, well, spiritual death came upon them, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. And because they were banished from the garden, banished from the presence of the tree of life, then physical death came upon all mankind, Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. Brethren, Satan is very good at what he does. And from that time until now to the end of the world, there are none righteous. No, not one. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Because we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. God hates sin to the point that it separates us from him so that he will not even hear our prayers. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. It breaks that fellowship that we once had. And now think of this. If God did not want men to be saved, he would have taken care of the human problem way back then. He either would have destroyed them right on the spot, or he would allow them to continue in sin and perish in the end. But we're told that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, 2 Peter 3, verse 9. Notice that God gave that wicked Jezebel, who was a member of the congregation of Thyatira there in Revelation chapter 2, space to repent. He wanted her to repent, but she didn't. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which is lost, Luke 19, verse 10. 
But we know the majority of this world is traveling down that broad road to destruction, Matthew 7, verse 13. So the point is, is that repentance is man's part. God has done everything that he needs to do in order to save our souls. But the choice for us to be saved is ours and ours alone. Considering all this, I think it would do us good to see what God is like. According to the writings of the Apostle John, God is a spiritual being, he's an intellectual being, and he's an emotional being. Concerning the fact that he is a spiritual being, we're told in John 4.24 that God is a spirit. He is not materialistic. He's not confined to time that we know of, but he is an eternal being. Speaking about his intellect, in 1 John 1 verse 5, we're told that God is light. And in him is pure light. There is not even one little bitty speck of darkness in him. And oftentimes in the scriptures, light is synonymous to truth, to knowledge, to purity, and so forth. Concerning his emotional side, we're told in 1 John 4, verse 8 and verse 16 that God is love. His is the ultimate love. It's a revealed love, a giving love, an undying love. But it's also a forgiving love and a demanding love. And this is the same type of love that we are to reciprocate back to him. God manifested his love toward us. It was manifested in the creation of God as he gave us everything that we need to survive in this life, both spiritual and physical. We see this love manifested in the Abrahamic promises that involved a people, a place, and a person, talking about the Messiah. And his love was manifested through the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, which allows man to have redemption through him. Two passages reveal this wonderful love so vividly. One we all know by heart, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the second one was spoken by the Apostle Paul in Romans 5, verse 8. But God commended this love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the church that Christ built is a rich display of that love. But God only, not only gave evidence that he wants man to be saved, but also he has the ability to save us. In the Old Testament, God is referred to the Almighty, the El Shaddai, no less than 56 times. And one time he's referred to as omnipotent. Brother Robert R. Taylor made this observation, observation concerning the God of heaven. And I love his writings. I love the way he words things. So I want to read this to you. He said, God was all-powerful in the dynamic drama of unfolding creation in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. He was all-powerful in bringing the universal flood upon the world of the ungodly and in the preservation of animal and human life aboard the massive ark. He was all-powerful in releasing Israel from Egyptian tyranny, parting the waters of the Red Sea, feeding and watering them in the wastelands of a barren wilderness, parting the waters of the flooded Jordan, and settling them in Canaan against the combined forces of pagan nations long inhabiting the land between the Jordan River and the Great Sea to the west. He was all-powerful in shielding them from would-be oppressors as the historical books from Joshua through Esther amply exhibit. <clears throat> he was all-powerful in paving the way for the coming of heaven's Messiah and the redemption he would tender to the ruined and wrecked sons and daughters of Adam's race. He was all-powerful in what he did through John the Baptist, through his only begotten son, through apostolic agency, in the establishment of the church, and its amazing spread throughout the Jewish, Roman, and Grecian world of that eventful first century. He is all-powerful in saving men from the ravages of sin. His power for accomplishing such is unleashed in his gospel of dynamite, the power to blast sins out of the human heart. And he references Romans 1, verse 16 and 17, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, and James 1, verses 18 through 21. He continues and says, His all-powerful nature will be witnessed by a watchful universe in a stupendous sort of way in the final wind-up of mundane matters as he, through his Son, will judge all, consigning the wicked to hell, 
and bringing the redeemed home to heaven in the sweet by and by. In creation, preservation of what he made, in pardon, in prayer, and in providence, we see the El Shaddai, the Almighty God, in admirable action. If God can speak this universe into existence and create it out of nothing, and if he can destroy it in the wink of an eye, surely he can save our souls. He has the ability to do that. God no doubt has the want to, and he certainly has the ability to do so. We also are given evidence that God has also prepared for man a savior. A major theme that is running all throughout the Old Testament is that Christ is coming. This was made known to mankind in the beginning at the fall of man in Genesis 3 verse 15 where God told the serpent, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. This no doubt is a prophecy concerning the victory of Jesus over death and over Satan through his victorious resurrection from the dead. In fact, Paul even emphasizes this in that great resurrection chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 22. Listen to what he said. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. <clears throat> Yes, God loved man so much that he gave us a savior. In fact, in Deuteronomy 18, verse 18, God told Moses concerning the children of Israel, I will raise them up a prophet from among them, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Peter quoted this verse in the temple there in Acts chapter 3, verse 22. And he made it plain, that prophet that Moses was talking about, is none other than Jesus the Christ. All throughout the Psalms, we have reference of this coming Savior. In Psalm 2, verse 7 and verse 12, speaks of God's Son. Paul quotes verse 7 in the, in the synagogue there at uh, Antioch of Pisidia and references it to Christ's resurrection from the dead. In Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11, mentions that Jesus' soul is not going to be left in Sheol, Peter quoted this there on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 31, referencing it to Christ. In Psalm 22, we have reference to Christ as the great suffering servant. In verses 6 through 8, it speaks of his harassment. In verse 16, it speaks about how his hands and his feet were pierced. In prophetic language, in Psalm 35, verse 19, tells how he would be hated without justification. Psalm 40 verses 6 through 10 mentions his incarnation. Psalm 110 verse 1 tells of how he will be seated at God's right hand, fulfilled when he ascended back to the Father in, in Mark chapter 16 verse 19. Then we see the prophet Isaiah speaking about his virgin birth, Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, calling him the Almighty God, Isaiah 9 verses 6 through 9. And then he describes him as that sacrificial lamb upon whom the iniquity was laid upon him, the iniquity of us all, Isaiah 53, verses 6 through 7. John the baptizer even referenced this there in John 1, 29. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Daniel 2, 44 mentions his everlasting kingdom. Chapter 7, verse 13 through 14 tells of the son of man's reception of his kingdom when he returned back to the Father in heaven. Isaiah 2, Daniel 2, Joel 2 speaks of his kingdom. Micah chapter 5, verse 2 talks about his birthplace, that little town of Bethlehem. Zechariah chapter 6, verses 12 through 13 calls Jesus the branch who built his kingdom as king and priest simultaneously. <clears throat> and then Chapter 11, verses 12 through 13, talks about the betrayal money. Malachi 4, 2, portrays Jesus Christ as the son of righteousness, the S-U-N, with healing in his wings. John 1, verses 1 and 14, John talks about Jesus being God, who was made in the flesh. 
Verses 9 through 13 describes him as the light of the world that gave men the opportunity to become children of God. Chapter 14, verse 6 speaks of him as the way, the truth, and the life, and the only access to the Father. Chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, he describes himself as the resurrection and the life. And then Paul says that it's through him we have access to the Father, Ephesians 2, verse 18. Time and time again, all throughout the Bible, we are told that God has prepared for man a Savior who is sufficient for our salvation. And this wasn't from some sudden impulse. It wasn't from some whimsical afterthought. But Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. We also see evidence that God has prepared for man a place for the saved. Not only was Jesus foreordained before the foundation of the world, but so was his kingdom, Matthew 25, 34, which is the church. After all, Jesus can't be a king if he doesn't have a kingdom, and he is now king of kings. For those who look to him for their savior, Jesus Christ has a special place for them to abide. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus utters seven parables concerning the kingdom. He gives the parable of the sower, the parable of the tares, the parable of the mustard seed, the leaven, the hidden treasure, the pearl of great price, and the parable of the dragnet. And after he finished giving all these parables, it says in verses 34 and 35, All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them that it might be fulfilled which is spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. The kingdom of Christ was now being made known through parables in a very aggressive fashion because the kingdom was now at hand, Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. To those who were seeking it, they would easily find it. Those who refused it, they would remain deaf and blind. And it was God's good pleasure to give to you a kingdom, Luke chapter 12, verse 32. This kingdom is a place that we can serve our king, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're not in his kingdom, friends, you're serving somebody else. You're serving some other king. Let's take our Bibles and let's go to Matthew 16. Matthew chapter 16. Now, Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus promised that he was going to build his church. But I want to know some of the circumstances that surround this promise. We're going to begin in verse 13 of Matthew 16. Matthew 16, 13. It says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, and am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some Elias, others Jeremiah, are one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I want to give you some background of the place called Caesarea Philippi. There where they are at, there is a large hole in the ground at the base of Mount Hermon, right in the the rock. And out of it is gushing tons of water. And the people called this the gates of hell. Now, to the pagan mind there at Caesarea Philippi, that was actually the gate to the underworld. And the pagans of Jesus' day believed that the fertility gods would actually spend the wintertime in the underworld, and in the spring they would come back and they would play among the people. Niches were carved in the cliff walls and they were filled with idols and with shrines. And it was a center of very immoral worship practices. In order to entice the return of their god Pan, of course, they would each year engage in these horrible deeds, including prostitution, 
sexual interaction between humans and goats because Pan was half man, half goat. They would also practice, uh, uh, lost my word, human sacrifices, including infanticide. And plus, this huge cabin of water the, to the people thought that it, was, it had no bottom to it. And it prevented anyone except for those gods from returning from the underworld. <clears throat> when Jesus Christ brought his disciples to this area, I'm sure they were quite shocked because this was the red light district of Israel. <clears throat> and devout Jews avoided any type of contact from the, from the despicable acts that were committed there. <clears throat> Excuse me. It seems that, of course, Jesus intentionally detoured to this place so that he could teach a lesson concerning the gates of Hades, which would represent either the doors of death or the epitome of evil, and teaching them that these things would not overcome Christ or his church or his people. Satan would not overcome Christ or the Christian. The pagans, they carved shrines and idols to their gods surrounding this grotto. They'd place them in that huge rock there. Jesus said his church was going to be built upon a more substantial rock, the fact of his deity, that he is the Son of God and the only God. And also when Christ would be put to death later, he was not going to stay in Hades. He would not be overcome by death, but rather he would overcome and it was upon this background that Jesus said he's going to build his church. And notice the singularity. He never said, I'm going to build my churches. I'm going to build my church, only one. And his church is the only one that will overcome. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 15, 13, every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. If Jesus didn't build it, he's not going to protect it. In fact, he says he's going to root up any church or religion that he didn't build because they are nothing but tares and weeds. This church that Jesus built is the refuge of the saved. It is to that church that Jesus adds those who are being saved to Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Now consider this. Paul says that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the body, Ephesians 5:23. And since the body is the church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, Colossians 1, verse 18, then common sense tells us that there are none that are saved outside of his church. And this kingdom, of course, is for all. It is true that God has chosen us to be heirs of the kingdom, James chapter 2, verse 5, but this is not a, a random arbitrary choice that James is talking about. Paul tells us that we have been predestinated unto Jesus Christ, unto the adoption of children, Ephesians 1, verses 5 and verse 11. Peter said that we have been foreordained before the foundation of the world, 1 Peter 1, verses, uh, verse 20, uh, 1 Peter 1, 20. So in other words, God in his foreknowledge knew that he had, before he had created the world, that man was going to commit sin. And that man would only be saved through the redemptive plan that he would give through his son. That is the foreordination, the predestination that the Bible speaks of. Those who conform to what God had already foreordained, they will be the saved. So everybody has the ability to become a member of that glorious church through their own choice, not just a select few that's chosen by somebody else. We have to choose, or we get to choose, whether we're going to be in the kingdom or not. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile, whether you're bond or free, whether you're male or female, we are all one in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3, 28. And God has reconciled both Jew and Gentile into one body, into one church, Ephesians 2, 16. And we enter into that body by the one baptism, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. But you have to be in that one body, in that one church, in order to be saved, in order to be reconciled unto God. You can't get there in some man-made denominational body. This is God's design. And if you want to be in God's graces, you have to do his will. You have to do it according to the way he said so. But we also notice that there is evidence 
that God has prepared a means of salvation. I'm talking about his word. Jesus Christ came to this earth with a message, a message concerning his kingdom, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Jesus came and he spoke the words of life, John 6, verse 63. And these words were the gospel. These were the good news to mankind. These are the words of salvation. Remember, the gospel is God's power unto salvation, Romans 1, verse 16. And these are the words by which we are saved, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 and 2. James says that it is that engrafted word which is able to save our souls, James 1, 21. Peter said it is by that word that we are born again, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. And remember, Jesus said we must be born again to see the kingdom of God, to enter into it. John chapter 3, verses 3 and verse 5. Now, Paul tells us how we are born again in Romans 6, verses 3 through 5. We are born again through the act of obedience in the act of baptism. We are buried with Christ in baptism. We are risen to walk in newness of life. Over and over again, we see the importance of the Word of God as it pertains to our salvation. Paul tells us in Ephesians 1 verse 9 that God made known the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure. This mystery was the good news of Jesus Christ, but it was hidden for many years, but it was made known in the fullness of time. The word mystery is a common term used by the Apostle Paul to refer to human redemption through Jesus Christ. Remember on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 souls, they received the word and they were baptized and added to the church, Acts chapter 2, verse 40. And the word of God tells us exactly what we have to do to be saved. It hasn't changed one whit from the day of Pentecost until now, and it won't change through the end of this world. It's the same gospel. If you remember there in Acts chapter 2, Peter and the other apostles were preaching the word of God. They were convincing the people of who Jesus Christ was, that he was the promised Messiah whom they crucified, that he was the son of God. Those who believed that message then realized there was something wrong. And they cried out to the apostles, says, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter told them, there's something else you have to do. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and to your children, to all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Obedience to that word is what saves us. It puts us into the body of the saved, Acts chapter 2, verse 47. That's why God wants you in his church. He's not willing that any should perish, but the choice is yours. If you haven't made the right choice up till now, now's the time to do it. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. James describes our life as a vapor that appears for a little time and then just vanishes away. We are not guaranteed the next minute of life. If your life is not right with God, you know what to do. Acts chapter two says it very plainly. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, repent of your sins, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you are a child of God and yet you're not have been faithful to that calling, maybe you strayed away from your pathway to duty. Maybe you need the prayers of this congregation. Whatever it may be, if you have a need, let, us, let it be known while together we stand and sing.